Thank you so much for having me here, uh, Jens. Uh, so far, as always, a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's fantastic, and there's always so much to learn. So uh, we'll switch gears a little bit here and talk about full endoscopic spine surgery. Um, and uh, as we have seen today uh, in the earlier lectures, uh, one of the most important things <laughs> for a physician is one of the most important things for us is to not do any harm. And I think, uh, as we have seen with adjacent level disease after disc arthroplasties, we can re reduce uh, the atrogenic sort of damage that we do with our procedures. And I think endoscopic spine surgery does very similar things. Here are my disclosures. Uh, learning objectives today, I want to introduce the concept of uh, full endoscopic spine surgery. Uh, and I want to uh, present the evidence that we have so far for um, ULBD. It's called, uh, it's, a, it's a fancy word for a laminectomy, um, both in the lumbar spine and in the cervical spine. Uh, the rational, why we do that, um, it really comes from Jens himself. Uh, Jens Chapman wrote this paper, and uh, I always like to quote this, is uh, where they've looked at uh, risk factors uh, of major spine surgery, uh, and they've looked at uh, different organ systems, uh, and looked at a whole bunch of uh, risk factors, which you see in the left lower corner. Don't read them, please. Um, and what they found is uh, the really two factors were significantly associated with, uh, with risks and complications. And this was age over 65 uh, and surgical invasiveness. So you can see here in five out of six organ systems, uh, we have uh, complications and they're co correlated with the age and the surgical invasiveness. So um, it really comes from there from non-MIS surgeons uh, that demonstrated the importance of uh, minimizing the invasiveness of our procedures. Um, and when people talk about endoscopic spine surgery, everybody thinks about discectomies, and I will not talk about discectomies here at all. Uh, as you can see here, we published a paper uh, last year on this where we looked at the uh, invasiveness and complexity of, of procedures, um, and we call it the benefit zone. Uh, looking at where is the benefit of, of minimizing a procedure that is already very good. And so discectomy is obviously very, uh, it's a not a very complex procedure, as you can see on the left side there. Uh, and the benefit of a discectomy done endoscopic versus MIS versus open is very, very little. So you can see it in the literature, endoscopic has 10% complications, traditional is 13% complications. So you, you will need thousands of cases to really sort of demonstrate the difference, even though there is one. Um, and so the difference is small because we're in the that zone of the, de of the, of the curve. Now, before we go to the other procedures, I really want to make sure that as we all spine surgeons, uh, as an example, very quickly, 58-year-old guy hit by a concrete wall while showering, sustaining a, a, a fracture and a kyphotic deformity on top of the previous ACDF. This, with a uh, deformity of his neck, this is not an appropriate candidate for neither disc arthroplasty nor an endoscopic decompression. So this guy needs a front back kyphotic deformity correction. Uh, and so as we all spine surgeons, uh, Please uh, always recognize that you know not every patient is a is a candidate for a, a, you know a, a non as a minimal invasive or a, as a motion sparing procedure. So let's go to the um, to the lower spine, the lumbar spine first. Uh, we'll go there. So we'll go up on the to the right side on the x axis, a little bit more invasive um, than a discectomy. Uh, we have, uh, with, together with the AO, we have uh, developed a system uh, and uh, stepwise protocols for these. So we call it unilateral laminotomy for bilateral decompression. Uh, this is mainly for the endoscopic surgeons. So the target area uh, that helps you to visualize and to get this procedure started. So uh, with our trainees and residents and fellows, so to find the target area is a bony landmark that you can. Uh, you can uh, visualize with the x-ray and the OR, you can palpate and you can visualize this directly with the endoscope. So that's every endoscopic procedure has this. Um, and so we have a target area here, uh, principal anatomical landmark, which helps you to get there. Uh, and we've done this with the AO and written a book on that. Um, and really is very helpful training and learning this. Quick example here, 57-year-old uh, male, uh, morbidly obese, losing his bladder function, multi-level spinal stenosis. As you can see, he is, uh, uh, he is, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, soft tissue to go through. Um, and uh, he did a, we did on him, we did a four-level decompression. Uh, he's now actually already three years out and doing really well. Uh, as you can see, that he allowed me not to cover his face on the images. Uh, doing extremely well. 
What I wanted to show you here, in line with the previous talks, of what this procedure allows us, and again, I can't go into the details technically do that, but what you can see there on the right lowest um, side is allows you to spare the facet joints because you can, you have ax, off-axis visualization. The endoscope uh, looks 15 uh, degrees around the corner, uh, and for that reason, you can undercut the facet joints, both ipsilateral and contralateral, which is uh, in difference to the MIS technique where you have to have a direct view, so you can't look around the corner. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's one of the main uh, benefits of this kind of procedure. So what does the data look like? So we published a, a paper with one of my uh, previous residents and now fellow uh, Cornell. Um, so we looked at 95 uh, consecutive patients. Uh, here you see that uh, most procedures were one or two levels. Surgical time, there was a beginning of learning curve. So obviously uh, a lot of time we spent there to learn this and then work out the uh, um, you know, the procedures, uh, but from the very beginning, it was very clear that um, uh, the outcomes were at least as good or better than MIS de uh, decompressions. Uh, as you can see, the ODI at, uh, at one year was uh, better, uh, the back pain was better, as well as the leg pain. Uh, and again, that's comparing full endoscopic versus minimally invasive uh, decompressions. Um, but um, I think what was most uh, striking uh, about this is that we were able to reduce our complications by uh, almost a factor of three. It's the same as we saw earlier with the disc arthroplasty, uh, in that uh, MIS decompressions had a complication rate of 26 uh, and endoscopic uh, of around 8%. And that was the beginning of the learning curve. Um, again, you can see here some of the complications maybe not that uh, serious with transient urinary retention, but it still requires a hospital stay with a catheter uh, and definitely something that we want to avoid in our patients. Uh, what does the rest of the literature look like? So um, to put that together, so we have um, one of the other patients, uh, one of the other studies by Dr. Rutten. So he looked at uh, ULBDs in the lumbar spine and he found the uh, uh, a complication rate of around 14%, uh, again, in the larger cohort uh, of uh, 72 uh, patients. Uh, another study uh, by Dr. Park, uh, they looked at bipodal, uniportal, and MIS, um, and uh, found that the improvement was very similar in those procedures, uh, but there was less operative pain uh, following the endoscopic procedures. Uh, and again, in their hands, very similar 11% uh, complication rate. Uh, they did better with the MIS, around 15%. Um, other study uh, published on uh, the uniportal and bi uh, bilateral decompression uh, of 106 patients uh, and also very similar 3.7% uh, complication rate. So uh, very similar outcomes in terms of pain relief uh, and very uh, advantageous uh, complication rates. Um, and when you look all, put all these data together as we did in our, in our paper there, um, we can look at traditional uh, laminectomies have a complication rates of around 30%, uh, including everything, even transient postoperative urinary retention, all the little things. Uh, and endoscopic uh, around 9%. Um, so uh, a factor of three that you can reduce uh, the complication rate. Um, and uh, it is clinically very, uh, very obvious in your patient population. So um, let's go a little bit further to the right on the curve. Um, so here's a, a patient that I'm sure you guys have seen. So an uh, elderly patient, as you can see in the left upper hand, I'll give you the story in a second. Uh, hyperlodotic in the cervical spine, buckling of the L ligament, losing his upper extremity function. Uh, and that's a perfect candidate for a, a, a endoscopic decompression there, uh, because certainly an 80 plus person would not tolerate a front back uh, cervical reconstruction. Well, like I've shown you in one of the first slides. Um, here again, 84 years old. Uh, he actually was a, a German radiologist. Uh, who uh, scared my residents with his old war stories, um, and history of lung cancer, and uh, complaints of uh, upper extremity loss of dexterity. So he was not able to write his messages anymore, use his computer. Uh, and you, as you can see, his uh, severe cervical spinal stenosis, uh, uh, in particular at uh, C2, C3, and C3, C4. As you can see, he's pinching off his spinal cord. Uh, what you can also see there, the pathology comes mainly from, from the back. Uh, so in contrast to um, indications for anterior decompressions um, with large discs and osteophytes that come from the vertebral body, here really had buckling from the yellow ligament. Um, 
And so in these cases, uh, we can do uh, full endoscopic decompressions. Uh, and you can see, this was very surprising for me, it's the amount of decompression that you can get on the, uh, on the right panel, you see the CSF around the spinal cord. Uh, so I was very surprised how extensive these compressions and how much space they provide to the spinal cord. So, um, and uh, we put that together, just recently published a study on that where we looked at 10 patients where we did this procedure, again, a small series, because uh, it's not that many patients that are appropriate for this. Um, but we had uh, 10 patients, all 70 plus years old, um, and 90% uh, of these patients uh, had loss of uh, dexterity, uh, most commonly at C3, C4. Uh, most, uh, half of the patient one level, half of them had two levels, uh, average follow-up uh, almost two years. Uh, we had one complication in this series where we had a transient loss, transient decrease of neurological function. She recovered fully at one year. Um, and you can see uh, neuric grades, uh, the MGOH, uh, all significantly improved at two-year follow-up. So a fantastic functional result. Uh, and I just operated on a lady two weeks ago who I was in the series. She is uh, 82 years old. Uh, she came two years ago. She couldn't feel her fingers anymore and do anything with her hands. And now she's back and she's like, oh, my veins work again, so can you do my lumbar spine? So I did an, a lumbar decompression, I think, two weeks ago on her. So um, uh, you can really give them the lives back and they can function again. Um, and this procedure is certainly more complex uh, and more dangerous than the lumbar decompressions, but uh, I think the benefit area in those patients um, is really tremendous. Um, and that uh, brings me to the conclusions. Uh, I think there's a, uh, there's a space in uh, spine surgery for these uh, minimal endoscopic decompressions. In my practice, it's around uh, 50%. Uh, a lot of my patients have transplants and are immunosuppressed. Uh, uh, and as of now, with uh, 1,500 procedures done in full endoscopic, I've not had a single infection. Uh, knock on wood, even though we have a lot of transplants and immunosuppressed patients at the University of Washington, which has been a, a blessing, more, more than a blessing. Um, endoscopic spine surgery achieves similar outcomes. I'm not claiming this, there's any difference. I think if you take the bone away and decompress the spinal cord, you decompress the spinal cord. Uh, there's no magic there. Um, but I think what, what really comes in there is that we can decrease the complication rates. Uh, and while you may say that having a Foley catheter for a day or two after lumbar decompression surgery is not a big deal, if it would be you, and um, we see that right now politically too, if it's you, it is actually maybe different. Um, endoscopic spine surgery uh, can replace arthrodesis procedures in, in some cases, um, but again, as I pointed out before, I think it's for spine surgery, it's really important to look at the whole armamentarium, and I do a lot of disc arthroplasties myself. Um, I think uh, endoscopic spine surgery has still ways to go. Um, there's very strong industry support there uh, to develop more efficient tools um, and also uh, training to train the next generation. It has a steep learning curve and typically with our fellows, they need 50 to 100 cases before they can stand on their own legs. Um, and that brings me to the end of my, discussion, end of my talk. Thank you so much. Uh, Chris, outstanding stuff. And right here, again, you're showing uh, this wonderful book. One of the key things that uh, I have seen from my practice, which is uh, just conventional um, based, is um, operator dependence. I have no doubt you get oriented in there very nicely. You know where you're going. You have certain landmarks. You're a teacher. You're structuring an educational portfolio together with Roger Hartle in New York that is um, going to really change the game. But I don't see that when I see other endoscopic surgeries done. I see under decompression, I see uh, the pars interticularis uh, resected. I see a wide mix of things where I have to suspect that the surgeon got lost in surgery. Yep. So how do you address that? Should you have a separate qualification? <laughs> uh, I, I think it's going to be like, like endovascular procedure for the, for the neurosurgeons, right? I think it's going to be part of our training. Um, Interestingly, when I, when, I, when I wrote this book, uh, what, it, what it became clear is that uh, 
in open surgery, you typically have like 10, 15 landmarks, right? We talked about the, you know, uncinate process. You see the longest collar muscle. You see the, the structure of the vertebral body. You have so many landmarks that together kind of guide you to your optimal sort of procedure and your placement. In endoscopic surgery, you almost always only have maybe one or two of these landmarks. Um, and so for that reason, when we teach our residents and fellows now, it's really those target areas that get you to the operative field, and then the principal anatomical landmark that gets you safely to the neurological structures and safely to confirm that you have done your procedure. So for example, you know, we talked a lot about decompressing cervical nerve roots, um, and you'll see that in the lab, too, even though we don't have an endoscope today, but for example, uh, comparing a minimally invasive foraminotomy versus an endoscopic foraminotomy, the endoscopic foraminotomy is going to be much, much more standardized and much more complete because you can visualize not only the pedicle, which is the landmark, but also the nerve root going beyond into the space outside the spinal canal. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's really that we are the beginning of our curriculum and teaching. Thank you.